Good morning, church family. I'm so glad that you chose to uh, worship with us this morning uh, through our virtual Sunday school class. Uh, and that's exactly what we hope to do this morning. Uh, so uh, welcome uh, to Brindley Mountain Baptist Church to our online Sunday school class. Uh, I'm excited again about this week's lesson. Today we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 14. And so uh, we're going to kind of follow the, the book on this one again. And again, we're going through Lifeways Explore the Bible. Uh, we're in session 7 today. And it's called uh, Living Wisely. And I don't know about you guys, but I could use all the help I could get in that area of my life. And so I encourage you to, to stay tuned, to, to listen up, and to hear the, the words of wisdom that God is giving us through, uh, through Solomon, through the book of Proverbs, uh, specifically in chapter 14. And we're going to look at verses 8 through 15 this morning uh, as our time of Sunday school. And so I, I just really do appreciate you taking the time to tune in. Uh, I encourage you to use that comment section below uh, to message us through uh, YouTube or, or Facebook or uh, text messaging or whatever you want to do just to let us know uh, how we can how we can improve, what we can do to make this more beneficial to you. Um, and most importantly, let us know ways that we can pray for you because we are a praying church at Brindley Mountain and we want to be praying for you, for your needs. And uh, as a matter of fact, let's just go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your many blessings, God. I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to thank you for who you are, Father. And uh, Lord, that's exactly what we're doing right here uh, this morning, God, that we could just uh, praise your name, Father. And I just uh, I pray for those needs that uh, that our church has, that that I have, that uh, those viewing this video have, Father. You know each and every need. You know what's on our hearts, Father. And, God, I just uh, I pray, Father, for those that are sick, uh, those that need a healing touch from you, Father. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just intervene, uh, that you would use the physicians, the nurses, uh, whoever it is, Father, that you would have uh, use. Father, I just uh, pray that you would do that, that you would bring healing to them, Father. And God, I just want to take a moment to, to praise you for the good reports that we've heard from church members, from uh, loved ones, God, that uh, you're, you're still working, you're still moving, God, and I just praise you for that, Lord. God, I just uh, I look forward to this time we're about to have in your word. Lord, I just pray that you would just speak through me, Father. Lord, that you would speak to me, and that, God, you would just forever change our, our lives from what we're about to learn, Father, from your words. And God, I just thank you for the opportunity uh, to read those, to meditate on them, Father, and to uh, learn more about you as we open our word, uh, your word, Father. And God, I just uh, I pray for the events we have coming up. I pray for our nation, Father, as we uh, struggle to, to figure out what to do amid this pandemic, uh, amid other controversies and things going on, God. I just... Uh, I pray for wisdom for our leaders. I pray for discernment in, in our lives, God, that we could know uh, what you would have us to do, Lord, each and every day, God. And I just, uh, I, I do thank you and I love you. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so like I said, we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 14 today. Uh, and so we're going to start in verse 8. And uh, we're going to read through verse 15. Again, this is the uh, section that the uh, that our curriculum kind of highlights. And so we're going to go along with that. So uh, let's check this out. Uh, starting in verse 8, it says, The sensible person's wisdom is to consider his way, but the stupidity of fools deceives them. Fools mock at making reparation, but there is goodwill among the upright. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a person, but it ends, but its end is the way to death. Even in laughter, a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. The disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves, and a good one 
what his deeds deserve. The inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his steps. All right, and so this week, uh, they go a different way with the verses. So we're not looking at, uh, you know, say verses 8 through 10 to begin with, and then 11 through 13, and then 14 and 15. Instead, they, uh, they make a connection between uh, starting with verses 8 and 15. So again, verse 8, it says, The sensible person's wisdom is to consider his way. But the stupidity of fools deceives them. And then 15 says, The inexperienced one believes anything, but the sensible one watches his step. And so what, what we're supposed to see here is that uh, with, with wisdom comes prudence. Uh, and, and so uh, prudence is, is a term that uh, in our society, especially today, is kind of uh, looked down on. It, it's... Uh, normally uh, kind of has a negative connotation with it, right? You know, uh, Karen, don't be such a prude. Uh, things like that, you know, we hear those kind of things. And, and so uh, normally when we hear about prudence or, or being prude, uh, it's not normally a good thing in our society that we live in today. Uh, but, but really what prudence is, is prudence is uh, being thoughtful, it's thinking things through. It, it's uh, looking long term instead of short term. And so we see that um, if you think about it in terms of that, you can see where wisdom and foolishness are contrasted greatly in prudence. And so prudence is something that's extremely important. And it's uh, something that God's been working on me over and over again. And uh, it's something that uh, I'm trying to, to get better about. Uh, and I'm trying to allow the Lord to work over me and, and to make me more like Christ uh, so that I can be more prudent because I, I have a terrible, uh, terrible habit of not thinking things through. And so, you know, I think about things and and I come up with uh, what I think are really great ideas and I start working on them and then I realize, oh man, this is a lot more work than what I thought it'd be. And so then I kind of just let it go and, and, you know, things go unfinished and, and, uh, you know, you start thinking about that in your walk with Christ and... uh, you know, when I was reading this section of the curriculum, you know, I, I couldn't help but think of, of the way that Christ portrayed the gospel. Uh, he, he, didn't, he didn't change the truth of the gospel. He didn't change uh, what he was telling to uh, his, his audiences. He didn't say, hey, uh, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior so that uh, your life can be easy and it's going to be awesome and just come on along. Just don't even worry about the particulars. You know, we'll get there. You'll figure it out along the way. But rather, he, he told them, you know, consider this. Think about this before you make that decision. And I think a lot of times in, in our walk with Christ and in our culture today, the church in America, uh, we, we try to make uh, salvation so watered down. We try to water down the gospel. We try to water down what Christ calls us to do because we want we want other people to be receptive. We want other people to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we don't think long term. We don't think about the fact that, hey, these people are going to profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they need to understand what exactly that means. They need to understand that uh, making that proclamation is not something that's uh, you can just say it and it's so, but it's something that uh, your life changes forever. Uh, that uh, it's, not, it's not our works that save us, but, but through our salvation, good works are going to come about. And, and we're called to be different. We're called to be holy, set apart from this world. And yet, uh, you know, especially in America, the gospel has gotten to a point where uh, we just let anything go. 
and, and it's disheartening and it's it's crippling our witness it's crippling uh, the effectiveness of the church because there's so many who have professed to be Christians and they don't even go to church they don't even attend church they they don't they don't do anything they don't read their Bibles they don't spend time in prayer and yet you know if you ask them hey are you saved oh yeah 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 I prayed a prayer you know 17 years ago Oh, awesome. What church do you go to? I don't know. Uh, a lot of times in our community, I'm amazed by uh, the amount of people that I hear are, are members of our church. And I've never seen them. Not, not once. And, and that's a common thing that we get, especially where we live in the Bible Belt, where, where it's kind of expected. You're expected to be a Christian, um, whether or not you even know what that means. Uh, but in prudence, I think that it goes further than uh, that initial conversion. It goes further than uh, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It goes into uh, after, the, after you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It goes into a point where uh, we, and this is what God's really been working on me, is we have to have an eternal mindset. We have to be thinking uh, not just about this world, not, not about... Uh, what happens if I make this decision tomorrow or whatever, uh, but it affects us uh, greatly. And, and the things we do, the things that we don't do, uh, we're going to stand before God and we're going to have to give a, a, a testimony about that. We're going to have to give a reason for the things we said, uh, the things that we did, the things we didn't say, and the things we didn't do. And, and praise God that I have Jesus Christ as, as my propitiation of my sins. And, and that He loves me enough that He died for me on the cross. And, and it's through His blood, through His sacrifice, uh, that, that God is going to, to see me as clean and accept me into heaven. Uh, but, but we have a, a responsibility here on earth. And we're going to have to give an account for every word that we say. And, and you know, that can be scary. That can be terrifying. Uh, but I think that that's where wisdom comes into effect. This prudence, this forethought to what's coming next. And so uh, it's extremely important. We want to be prudent. We want to be uh, men and women and, and students uh, that that look past uh, just the surface. We look past things and we have an eternal mindset. We think about things in terms of, uh, okay, well, what is this going to do to my witness? If I react to this guy who just cut me off in traffic uh, the way that I want to react, uh, how's that going to reflect on the kingdom of God? If I say what I want to say to this customer service person, what, what am I going to... How am I going to justify that before God when I get into heaven and I have to give an account for those words that I've said? You see, it's, it's important as Christians, as followers of Christ, that we are prudent and, and we can have that wisdom uh, when we study God's Word, when we're reminded over and over and over again of the things that are to come. Uh, of the treasures that are going to be built up in heaven that like we talked about last week uh, when we read about the judgment and throne and uh, we read about the fact that we're going to have to give an account for every word that we speak uh, for every action that we take everything that we uh, didn't say or didn't do and so uh, being grounded in God's word helps us to be wise, to live wisely, in that we can be prudent and it's a reminder uh, that there's more to life than right here, right now. And I think that's an excellent reminder, something that we definitely need to hear, especially in times like this where, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there who say, man, we're not promised tomorrow, so uh, how am I going to live today? And, and you can go, you know, Two, two alternates there, right? You, you can either say, okay, well, I, I definitely need to live for Christ and do everything I can to, to share Him with my friends, with my family, uh, with those that I love. Or, or you can go the other end to say, well, you know, hey, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's got its own problems and I don't even know if it's going to come, so I'm just going to do whatever I want. Uh, and so uh, that's the difference between wisdom 
and, and foolishness. Uh, is that discernment, that knowledge, that prudence of knowing that uh, whether tomorrow comes or not, we're still going to be held accountable for our actions today. So not only are we called to be sensible or, or prudent as Christians, as followers of Christ, uh, but we're also called to be uh, content. And that's another indicator of, of godly wisdom is contentment. And so in our curriculum, it points us to verses 9 and 14 for that. And so again, it says, Fools mock at making reparation, but there is goodwill among the upright. And then 14 says, The disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves, and a good one what his deeds deserve. And so I think here again we see... Uh, in verse 9, it talks about the fools mocking at making reparations. And so uh, in today's society, in today's uh, times, you know, uh, reparations uh, brings about a, a very particular thing that's going around in our, in our uh, social lives and in the political rings and things like that. Uh, but what this is referring to is reparations of sins. And so uh, it's referring back to, to offerings that were supposed to be given. It was uh, referring back to uh, reparations that were supposed to be made if somebody uh, were to lie or cheat or, or steal or something like that. Uh, there were certain things that they were expected to do, certain reparations that they were expected to make. Uh, as, as a sign of forgiveness, as a sign of, uh, of wanting to make things right. And so that's what we see in verse 9, uh, that the fools mock that. The fools think that's ridiculous. They're, they're not going to go about, you know, they're not going to go and, and bend over backwards to, to ask for forgiveness of their sins, to do the things that God calls them to do, uh, to have a right relationship with Him. And then it says, but there is goodwill among the upright. And as followers of Christ, we need to have goodwill. Goodwill towards other people. Uh, you know, uh, we need to, to be men and we need to be women of God that uh, courageously stand up and admit when we're wrong. And we do what we can to make those things right. Uh, and again, our, our salvation doesn't come from uh, anything that we do. Uh, but it's everything that God does in us and, and through us. And so uh, we have to be uh, content uh, with, with doing things the way they need to be done. And, and sometimes that means that we are going to face fallout. Um, when we admit that we're wrong, when we admit that we made a mistake, uh, it can be damaging to relationships. It can be damaging to uh, our, our employment it can be damaging in lots of ways, uh, but but as men and women of God, we need to be willing to make that statement to to do what's right. And, and uh, again, I, I think it really harkens back to this eternal mindset, this mindset of this this isn't you know everything that that God has in store for me. God God's God desires more for me. He He wants more for me. He expects more of me. And so we, we have a high calling that we need to answer to. And then verse 14, it says, The disloyal one will get what his conduct deserves. Uh, other translations uh, render that not as disloyal one, but as backsliders. And so uh, it, it appears that it's referencing those that know God's commandments, that uh, have started down the, the road of salvation. They've uh, began to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, um, but for whatever reason, they've backslidden. And, and the Bible's clear here. They're going to get what they deserve, and uh, they're going to... They're going to make their bed and lie in it is essentially what it's saying or you know uh, as christians we're supposed to produce good fruit and when we when we turn our back to god when we backslide we're not going to be producing good fruit um and and this is saying that uh, they're gonna they're gonna reap what they sow and so that's another 
term that the the scriptures use for for these kind of things and so but then on the flip side it says a good one or or a wise one uh what his deeds deserve and so uh again i want to make it abundantly clear that it's not what we do that saves us it's not um, how we act it's not the words we use uh, it's not the things that we say that save us um, we're, we're saved by faith alone through Jesus Christ uh, however those that salvation uh, should put a desire in your heart uh, to do what's right to follow Jesus Christ to do what he calls us to do and to uh, produce good fruit and uh, the Bible tells us that we're going to reap what we sow. And so if you're uh, sowing discontentment, if you're sowing things that um, are not of God, you're going to reap those things. Uh, at the same time, if you're uh, sowing love and, and compassion and, and goodwill towards others, uh, then you're going to uh, reap that as well you know and, and when we get to heaven there's going to be uh, storehouses of treasure and so um, this is where the contentment comes in and so uh, we you know if you think about it if you think about times where you've sinned uh, you know maybe maybe you can think back to you know it seems like everybody has this this testimony that uh, when they were a child they were in the grocery store and they saw that candy bar and they wanted that candy bar so they took that candy bar so let's think about that let's think about that in terms of contentment uh, if if we as a child was content with the fact that uh, our parents were buying us you know fruit or you know whatever if we were content with the fact that, hey, as soon as we get home, we're going to have a snack. It'll be okay. I'm not going to die of hunger. If we were content in those things, we wouldn't steal that candy bar. Yet we had discontentment. Whether that's, um, you know, I never get candy bars or I haven't had a candy bar yet today or whatever. Uh, there's that discontentment that, that led us into sin. And so as followers of Christ, it's important that we, we are content with where God puts us because God puts us in places and situations for a reason. And so it's not that we're uh, content with uh, our, our circumstances. It's not that we're, we're content necessarily with um, what we've been given. Uh, but it's that we're content, we, we're understanding enough, we're wise enough to know that uh, as Matthew chapter, I believe it's chapter 6, tells us that, you know, hey, the birds of the air don't worry about what they're going to eat or where they're going to stay. And the flowers don't worry about what they're going to wear because God provides for them. And it's in that contentment, that contentment and knowing that, hey, you know, this may not be ideal, this may be not be what I want but this is where God's placed me, and God's placed me here for a reason. Let me move. Let me act. Let me do uh, everything I'm doing for the Lord, for His kingdom, to grow His kingdom, uh, to let other people know about how much He loves them. And, and through my contentment, in times where uh, discontentment is expected, that can be a powerful, powerful testimony to those around us to those that love us, to those that uh, don't even know us, if they see us being content with what God's given us, being content in, in what God's doing in our lives, uh, that, that speaks so much more so than uh, when we're acting in discontentment and we're living in sin because of it. Uh, we need to be content in what God gives us. So not only is the wise person going to be prudent and content, but he's also going to be joyful. And so in verses 10 and 13, we see that. Verse 10 says, The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. In verse 13, it says, Even in laughter a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. And so... Uh, what we need to see here is that true joy, uh, joy that 
uh, isn't dependent on the, our circumstances, on the things going on around us. Again, hearkening back to that contentment. Uh, true joy comes in that contentment. True joy comes in resting in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we can have true, lasting joy because everything on this earth is fleeting. So if, if you're looking for joy in uh, your your material things in, in the awesome collection of Star Wars characters or uh, whatever it is that you're into, if you're you know looking for joy to come from uh, buying that new Corvette Stingray that you've been wanting, if you're looking for joy in you know buying that house that you've been you know desiring for so long, if you think that's where joy is going to come from, you're mistaken because those things are fleeting. They go away, uh, especially that Corvette Stingray, man. You drive that off the parking lot and it's worth half of what it was. But true joy, true joy comes from the Lord and He wants to give that to us. He wants to pour that out on us so much so that it overflows because He wants that joy that He gives us to overflow to our friends, our family, our neighbors, so that they can experience the joy of the Lord as well. And so we see that through wisdom comes joy. And, and it comes because uh, we are prudent. We, we have that foresight, that, uh, that discernment and that knowledge to look beyond what's right in front of our face. And we have the contentment to be content with what God gives us, the blessings that God pours out on us. Because no matter where you are in your life, no matter how hard things are, there are blessings that God is just pouring out over you abundantly. And so we need to count those blessings. We need to be content on what the Lord's doing in us. Uh, and we need to be uh, showing Him our appreciation through the way that we live our lives. And God's going to bring us joy. He, he wants to give that to you because, like I say, it's, it's a way that we can bless others. It's a way that uh, we can share the joy of the Lord with those around us. And so I encourage you to, to let that joy flow. And so, uh, verse 10, it says, The heart knows its own bitterness, and no outsider shares in its joy. Even in laughter, a heart may be sad, and joy may end in grief. And so I think, I think about these things, the flip side of what I just said, these people that are finding their, their identity in, in their possessions. They find their identity in things that are not of God. Uh, you know, we see this a lot in, in younger uh, men and women, uh, boys and girls who find their identity as uh, maybe the class clown or uh, the party animal or uh, the guy who will do anything to, to you know, whatever. We, we see these kind of characteristics, these people. We know, you know, people come to mind when you think about that. And so, um, but do they have true joy? Uh, you know, I think about um, people that are, we live in a social media age, and so, you know, it's all about the number of hits their, their video gets or uh, the number of followers they have, things like that. There's uh, so many young people that are wrapped up in that, that mindset, that belief that they, they find their identity in what others think of them. And I think about how stressful that has to be. How difficult that has to be to live your life that way that, you know, you can't be happy unless somebody else is, is jealous of your life or somebody else is, is envious of what you have. Uh, you know, what a terrible life that is to live. God wants to free you from that. God wants to make it where... Uh, you can find peace, you can find hope, you can find joy in Him, in Him alone. And so, uh, what a blessing it is to serve a God who loves you just the way that you are. Yes, uh, he, he hates the sin, He hates the sin in your life, uh, but He loves you. And He loves you so much so that even though you're a sinner, 
And this is true for me. Even though I was a sinner, He loved me so much that He sent His Son to die on that cross for me. And that brings me joy. It brings me so much joy to know that the Creator of heaven and earth loves me so much so. He desires to have a relationship with me so much so that He sent His Son to die on that cross. And it's not a testimony of how great that I am because I am far from great. I am... Paul says he was the lowest of the low. I disagree. I, that's me, buddy. I don't deserve it. But our God has so much love that He desires a relationship with us. He wants us to have joy. And so that's the beauty of wisdom in, in knowing that our joy doesn't come from the things that we own. It doesn't come from the accomplishments we can make. It doesn't come from uh, becoming famous. It doesn't come from being a good person. The Bible tells us that none are good. No, not one. But it comes from Jesus Christ. It comes from the Lord. And that's where our joy comes from. And the amazing part about that is that it's never going to run dry. It's never going to go away because it's what the Lord gives to us. It's His gift to us, this joy that uh, transcends all understanding. This joy that even during a pandemic, we can have faith. We can have joy because we have hope. And, and wisdom Godly wisdom, living wisely, is dependent on us having joy. Alright, so not only are we supposed to be sensible or, or prudent, not only uh, are we supposed to be content, not only are we supposed to be joyful, but finally I want us to see that we're supposed to be thriving. And so in verses 11 and 12, it says, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. And so as we close thinking about this thriving, how, how does one thrive? What does it mean to thrive? Uh, you know, uh, our, our church, I'm excited about it. Brother Trey is uh, showing us what the Lord's revealed to him. And uh, one of the tools that God's used to, to reveal his plan for our church to him is, is a book by Tom Rayner that's called uh, The Anatomy of a Revived Church. And, and the, the backing behind it is this desire, um, this calling to be a church that is thriving and so what does it mean to thrive to thrive means that uh, we're not worried about what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or next month it means that we're not concerned about whether our bills are going to get paid uh, we're not concerned about whether or not we're going to need to shut the doors of the church uh, but we're thriving we're growing we're we're making a difference for the Lord. And, and that's, that's our heart's desire, that we would grow closer to God. And so, as we read these scriptures, uh, we see in verse 11, it says, The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. And so I want you to see how definitive that statement is. How definitive it is. It says the house of the wicked will be destroyed. It will be destroyed. And then it says that the tent of the upright will flourish. Now I want you to think about the terminology that it uses there as well. Not only that uh, it, these things will be destroyed and that these things will flourish. But I want you to think about uh, the building itself. It says the house of the wicked will be destroyed. And then it says the tent of the upright will flourish. And so a lot of times in our life, uh, you know, and I'm guilty of this too, we expect our, our good deeds. We expect uh, 
things that are uh, people that are doing the right things with the right motives. We expect them to be blessed here on earth. Uh, but I want you to see the terminology here that it uses a building, something that is uh, substantial, something that is uh, concrete, you know, immovable, uh, as talking about the wicked. The house of the wicked will be destroyed. And then it says, but the tent of the upright will flourish. The tent. And so when I think about a tent, I think about something that's movable, something that uh, comes and goes, something that sets up and gets taken down. And, and I think that's exactly uh, why Solomon used these words, that, that we see this contrast between a house and a tent. Um, because as followers of Christ, we need to understand that uh, this world, this earth is not our home. It's not where we're called to to be and that's it uh, but but earth is just somewhere that we're passing through it it's it's this side of eternity for us and so uh, it's a tent it, it's something that's movable it's something that's mobile it's something that's temporary because that's our life here on earth it's temporary it's just uh, a small blimp on on the on the wide screen of of eternity and so, uh, as Christians, we need to remember that while we're facing pro uh, persecution, uh, while, while things may seem unfair to us, uh, we need to understand, uh, one, that, that those things are going to be addressed by God. Uh, again, the house of the wicked will be destroyed. In verse uh, 12, uh, there's a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. Uh, the foolish person doesn't think about things eternally. They think about here and now, and so they set up their house on earth. They set up, uh, they put their stock, they put everything they have in the here and now. Whereas Christians, we need to be investing in eternity. We need to be working for God. We need to be working to build His kingdom, to plant seeds, to nourish those seeds. We need to be working for the kingdom of God because that is, is ultimately where we're going to end up and we know that and that's wisdom there, knowing where we're ending up. And when we do that, um, we're going to see growth. We're going to see thriving, uh, not just uh, thriving in, in our church membership, not just thriving in uh, our, our Sunday school attendance, uh, but thriving in our lives. And it's through our obedience to Jesus Christ, it's through our, our willingness to do what God calls us to do, that He is going to bless us and, and make our lives thriving. And, and we're not going to find our value in our possessions. We're not going to find our value in our work, uh, but we're going to find our value in Jesus Christ. And when we do that, that is when we become thriving. Uh, that's when our, our life makes sense. That's when uh, everything uh, starts connecting and, and those, you know, we just, we just have to do it. We have to follow Jesus Christ wherever He leads us, and we have to be content uh, with what He gives us to do that. We have to be prudent. We have to be sensible about what God's calling us to do. We have to think things out. And we have to do it. And, and we have to be content with what we've got. And then we are going to be joyful because God is going to give us His joy. He's going to bless us uh, so that we can bless others. So that joy can overflow from us. And when we're doing all those things, we're going to be thriving. We're going to be thriving on the Word of God. We're going to be thriving, working for the kingdom of God. And we're going to see revival, not just in our church, not just in our community, uh, but in our lives personally. And that's where revival starts. It's going to start inside of each and every one of us. And so I'm praying for you guys. I, I pray that you would pray for me as we uh, strive to, to live wisely. And, and so this, these are just a few things that we can do to live wisely.
And so that's all I've got for Sunday School this morning. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, just a reminder, please do use that comment section. Uh, send us a message. Shoot us a text message. Give us a call. Uh, because we want to be praying for you. We do love you. And man, we sure do miss seeing your faces. Uh, but we, we do understand um, with everything going on uh, that things just aren't aren't what they used to be. Uh, but I'm praying that God gets us back to normal soon because I really do miss you guys. So let's pray and then we'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for this day. Lord God, I just uh, pray that you would help me to live wisely, Father. Lord, help me to, to be sensible, to think things through, Lord, and to be dedicated to you and to the calling you've placed on my life, Father. And Lord, I pray that you'd help me to be content with the things you've given me. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the blessings you've bestowed on me, God. I, I thank you for the way that you've worked in my life, God. Lord, that you continue to work in my life, God. And I just uh, pray that you'd help me to be content. God, I pray, Father, that you would help me to uh, let your joy just overflow from my life, Lord. That uh, in these difficult times, Lord, that uh, you would help me just to show your love and your joy to those around me, Father. That they would uh, experience you. God, that's, that's my desire, that they would experience you. And God, I thank you for the way that you're moving in our church. I thank you for the way that you're moving in my life, God. Lord, I pray for revival. I, I pray for revival uh, in my heart. I pray for revival in the hearts of uh, those in, in this community, Lord. God, I know that you desire revival for this nation. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to be obedient that you would bring that, Father, to, to our nation, to this world, God. Lord, that we would turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, that we would accept you as, as Lord and Savior. That we would uh, live our lives in a way that reveals that we truly believe that you are God of all. And God, I pray for Brother Trey as he leads our church. I pray for him as uh, he brings the message this morning. God, I just pray, Father, that you would speak through him. Lord, that you would bless his ministry, God. And Lord, I pray for his family, for the things they have going on, God. I pray for each and every family that uh, our church reaches, God. Lord, that you'd be with them, whatever their needs are, God. I just lift them up to you. And God, I pray, Father, that you would help us to be about your work, to live for you, God. And Lord, I just, uh, I thank you for the promises that you give us, Lord. Lord, the promise that the tent of the righteous will flourish. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And Lord, I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.